Namaste. So here beginneth the fourth Adhikarna of the first Pada of the first Adhyaya, the first chapter of Brahma Sutra, Samanyadhyaya, which means the chapter on reconciliation. And the reconciliation that he's describing is that between the source of knowledge in the Vedas and other sources of knowledge which may be based on various logical reasoning and inference hammered out with logic. <laughs> so here Shankaracharya shifts gears. And first he presents a very sophisticated highly technical argument by the opponent, who is clearly a different type of person than the previous opponents, who were more or less ignorant and uh, more or less just, you know, going on their own intuition. This is a very sophisticated logical argument derived from the teachings of the Vritikaras, the Vritikaras are a group of commentators on the Shastras out of Kashi, which is now known as Varanasi, India. And they were mainly logicians. After all, even the word Vritikara means to make a difference or to make a modification or to make up a new theory, a new explanation. And so their chief stock in trade was wildly new theories to explain the scriptures. And of course, they came into conflict with Shankaracharya and uh, his gang because Shankara is a strict Vedic traditionalist, a Vedic absolutist that the Vedas are absolute knowledge of divine origin and they are not to be challenged, but they are to be approached in a spirit of submission to see, well, how can I explain this so that the Vedas are true and so that we don't run into any internal conflicts or contradictions in the Vedic philosophy? So, this ratchets up the game considerably, uh, and we'll see how Shankara deftly deals with this great challenge. But first, we're going to have to wade through some really technical stuff. And, uh, you know, in the spirit of presenting Shariraka Bhasya as it is, I'm not going to skip it or summarize it or dilute it or try to make it easy. It's not easy, so buckle up. And let's take a look at the fourth Adhyaya. Topic four, Upanishads reveal Brahman. Opponent, how is it again asserted that Brahman has the scriptures alone as its valid means of knowledge? For in the aphorism of Jaimini, since the Vedas are meant to enjoin action, those portions of them which have not this purpose in view are useless. One, two, one. It has been shown that the scriptures are concerned with action. Therefore, the Upanishads are useless, as they do not enjoin action. Or they may form part of an injunction about action by way of revealing the agent, the deity, etc. of that action or they may be meant for enjoining some other kind of action, such as meditation, on gods and others. For there is no possibility of the Upanishads being the valid means of knowing a thing already in existence, since an existing thing is known through direct perception, etc. Now let's take a look at this footnote. 
The validity of a means of knowledge consists in its revealing something that is not known through other means and is not sublated later. If a thing known through perception, etc., is again revealed by the Upanishads, the latter lose their validity. A thing already in existence means some positive thing which is an established reality, and as such it has no connection with any fresh effort for production. An action is needed for producing something, but not after it is already there. So this is a very sophisticated argument. In other words, they are saying, Brahman is pre-existing. In fact, everything is and always has been Brahman. And the Upanishads don't give a cause for any kind of action except to notice this, to acknowledge it, to recognize it, and to see it as the ground of all reality. There's no specific action recommended for this, although the Upanishads certainly do refer to karma yoga, which is action, bhakti yoga, which is a subtle action, and raja yoga, or meditation, as preliminary steps to facilitate and qualify one for ultimate self-realization. That realization is already there and does not have to be manufactured or produced by any action or any effort on our part. It is simply a matter of knowledge. And in that, the Upanishads are giving something that is not existing beforehand, which is the knowledge that Brahman exists, Brahman is the self, Brahman is the origin of everything, and so on, as we have seen in the preceding sutras. So then, why make such a big deal out of this? Well, Jaimini was the son of Vyasadeva, the son of the compiler of the Vedas, including the Upanishads. So if Jaimini then comes out and differs from his father, it says that the Upanishads actually are useless because they don't give any instructions that result in action. Or at best, they're simply a eulogy or praise that inspires us to value the revelations of the Upanishads and the knowledge that is given about Brahman. So as we will see, both of these explanations miss the point. The point is that without the Upanishads, nobody would even guess that Brahman exists. What to speak of that Brahman is the self? This is non-intuitive and non-logical also. It is not a matter of direct perception until one is in possession of the knowledge of Brahman. Then, of course, you can look at your experience and say, oh, yeah, of course I'm Brahman. What else could I be? What else could consciousness be but Brahman? And Brahman is therefore the origin of everything. <laughs> so once that becomes plain and obvious, there is no use for the Upanishads or any other scripture for that matter, or any action. Huh? Because in that moment of that insight, all problems become solved, all questions become answered, and all suffering is just completely deleted. Obviously, the opponent doesn't get this. The opponent is, how could I say, more like a religious legalistic arguer who makes a living by going around and arguing with people. <laughs> because in those days, there was no TV or radio, no internet. Uh, hardly even any books. The few books that did exist were, were laboriously copied by hand and usually only kept by scholars. 
So people like to hear discussions between learned contestants, debates, in fact. And usually there was some kind of a bet made as to uh, who won the debate and who lost the debate would usually have to become their disciple. So, you know, debating was a serious business in ancient India. That's why we see the whole uh, Brahma Sutra commentary cast in the form of a debate with a discussion between the opponent and the Vedantin. So this isn't the end of the opponent's argument. Oh, no. <laughs> so let's continue and see what he's going to say. And just because no human objective is gained through the revelation of something that is neither acceptable nor rejectable, it has been said, since the corroborative statements, artavada, can be combined with some injunction to form a single idea, they become a valid means of knowledge of virtuous deeds by way of eulogizing the duties enjoined by the injunctions. This is another quote from Jaimini Sutra 127. So two important points here. If Brahman is eternal and is the basis of everything, the source of emanation of all life and consciousness, etc., then any statements about it have to be atarvada or corroborative only. In other words, they can't reveal it because it already exists. And so, as Jaimini is trying to say, uh, in contradistinction to his father, trying to make a name for himself, you know, the kid's trying to make a name for himself, son of a famous father. It's such a familiar pattern. He goes out and argues that, well, the Upanishads don't really reveal anything that's not already known, because we all know aham brahmasmi, right? tattvam asi. This is common knowledge in those days. So the Upanishads don't tell us anything new, therefore they're useless. Or maybe their only value is that they praise Brahman and knowledge of Brahman. And in that way, they have some value to encourage people to explore and realize Brahman. This has been stated thus, so that sentences as he wept, Taitriya Samhita 2.5.11, may not become meaningless, but may serve some purpose by way of eulogizing. As for the mantras such as Ishe Tva, Taitriya Samhita 1.1.1, etc., they have been shown to be connected with action by virtue of their speaking about some duty or its means. Nowhere is a Vedic sentence seen to serve any purpose without some connection with an injunction, nor can it reasonably do so. Moreover, an injunction is not possible with regard to something already accomplished, for an injunction is concerned with action. Therefore, the Upanishads become supplementary to injunctions by realizing the nature of the agents and the deities needed in some action. Or, if this be not accepted out of fear of ignoring the context, still the Upanishads may relate to the meditations expressed by their own texts. Hence, Brahman is not validly presented as an object of knowledge by the scriptures. Oh, boy. Talk about sophistry. This is the kind of facile illogic that characterizes mental speculators of all types. Their only real point is doubt. They don't accept the scriptures at their face value, and therefore they can't attain the self-realization based on them. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>